Hey guys, it's Andre from the High Performance Academy and we're here at World Time Attack. We've just spotted Martin Donnan here with his R35 GDR. Now Martin, you're a pretty well known guy in the Australian circles. You've been around the magazine scene writing tech articles for just about ever. Tell us about your history with training. What have you been up to and how did you get involved? Oh look, it actually started probably 25 or 23 years ago. I'm pretty old, that's why I'm well known. Um, and uh, it actually started with Chicati Motorcycles back in 1980. Eight or nine, and then of course the Wonder Car of Australia came out, the VN Commodore, which was a tunable car, and it all sort of escalated from there. Now, involvement with GDRs comes from back in the day when the uh, R32 was first delivered into Australia. We had a, a brand new one, or my partner in the business, Kia Wilson, did he bought one brand new, and over a period of maybe 10 years, we developed that into the first uh, nine second GDR outside of Japan, and then the first eight second one out outside of Japan so we've always had this GDR thing in our blood and uh, thought logically it would be a good idea to transfer onto the 35 market when that came out and uh, yeah it's worked well for us. We make a lot of repair parts for the car, upgrade parts for the car and we've got a fairly substantial and good export market for them. So yeah we, we do a lot of tuning of them you might say and uh, we're here for a bit of fun this weekend. So this, this car here, you're telling me it's run some pretty impressive numbers on the quarter. You were saying it's run low nine so far, hence the RH9 number plate. Well, yeah, it's the first uh, GDR under the nine second zone in Australia. Uh, the car did run on a 3.8 litre engine with some pistons and rods in it and standard manifold turbochargers. It ran 9.6 at 147. Uh, we only got one or two chances to run up, so our local drag strip's fairly congested. Um, then we obviously we got kicked out for lack of parachute so forth. In, in, in the meantime, in the last couple of weeks, we've put a bigger four litre engine in it, a bigger uh, trust based turbocharger system on it. They're not quite trust TDO6 turbos, they're bigger. And of course, we, we can adapt it all up. We've uh, got a, a, an upgraded one to six six speed gearbox in it, we've got upgraded 18 plate clutches in it, we've got a Cyvex engine management system in it, full uh, fuel system in it. And it's, but, you know, it's still got Bluetooth, climate control cruise control, it, it's still quite a good street thing if need be. So you can still take it through your local drive through if you need to? Oh look absolutely, it still gets fairly good economy and the idle stays nice with the aircon on so they're the main things. Like I said we're pretty old so that stuff's important to us. Okay, so we've seen the R35 tuning scene around the world uh, go absolutely nuts over the last few years. It's a really popular car and you can see why with the amount of power and performance you can get out of these cars. First of all, I just want to ask you about the transmission. Obviously it's known to be a bit of a weakness there. Uh, there's a lot of people making parts for these transmissions. Tell us where you see the, the power limit for a stock R35 transmission and what do you need to do to support the kind of power you guys are seeing? Well. There is no power or torque limit as such, it's more about application limit. So uh, initially with the very old versions of launch control, launch control one, they would break first gear because it's quite small compared to say even an R32 first gear. Nissan softened that off with more clutch slip off the line so first gear isn't so much a problem for them now. Now the problem is fourth gear stripping itself just under straight line power load. So there are upgraded gear sets and main shafts out there now that stop fourth gear stripping itself. Uh, obviously the clutches and baskets can be a bit of a weak point. Uh, there are now billet baskets around for them, some of which are made in New Zealand, some of which we make and uh, distribute ourselves. Um, there's also a few little electronic gremlins in them. A lot of the sensor technology was, uh, the gearbox itself is a joint venture between the Japanese and the Americans and some of the American bit isn't really particularly reliable. There's a bit of Corvette in there. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, but you know what, it, it's not so much of a dark art, it's all about having the engine control unit speak to the transmission control unit properly and having the parts in, across the CAN bus that the vehicle's got and then having the parts in the transmission being strong enough to actually cope with the load. It's a bit, it was a bit of witchcraft in the early days but it, it, it's really not too bad now, they're actually quite a good thing. Okay, so let's move on to the engine. The Obviously you've, you've, you've done those bits to the transmission and it's holding together and that's great. Moving on to the engine, uh, with the tuning options available for these cars now, it seems that most people are, are still sticking with the reflash. We've got Cobb access port, uh, that's well known to work exceptionally well. We've got the Ecutec system as well. We've also got Cyvex and Motec have come out with standalone systems that still interface. Now I understand one of the issues, one of the reasons why it's been a while for aftermarket standalone systems that come out is the car's so damn complicated, we've got CAN bus etc. What, what do you see as the advantages between a reflash using say Cobb or Ecutec and Cyvex which you're running in this car? 
Well, look, for a, a, a street-driven or even a drag racing application, there's nothing wrong with running the stock ECU. Uh, you can run them in speed density mode, with no airflow meters. You can support up to 1,000 horsepower on the stock ECU. Um, in a dedicated race application, the, the Cyvex, and now I'm not really familiar with the Motec system, I'm sure it's very good, but I don't know a lot about it. But the Cyvex has some very advanced traction control, anti-lag functions. It, it allows flex fuel capability if need be. It's actually quite, it, rather than being able to run the engine better at a given power level, it allows you to run the engine better across a wider uh, base of, of applications. So in loose conditions, the traction control with the Cyvex is much better. Some of the throttle control stuff's better. There's not much you can't do with the standard ECU, but the standard ECU's really not designed to cope with three times the power level of the stock engine, I, I suppose you could say. Having said that, it is a very good standard ECU, and, and where we can, we stick with it. Sure, I, I, I understand that. I mean, the flexibility of a standalone is, is always going to be uh, beneficial. Uh, one, one of the things as well as a tuner I find a little bit frustrating with some of the uh, reflash systems is we obviously we can't tune these cars live you know we're, we're doing a pull on the dyno or down the track we're data logging that and then making changes so the the Cyvex system we can tune that live how much of an advantage for you is that when you're looking at a really seriously modified car? Well I'm not really the one to speak too much about real-time tuning because I'm actually not a great fan of it never have been the reason I'll say that is because uh, these things at you know plus a thousand horsepower level a dyno runs over in a second or you know five six seconds whatever the ramp speed is and you can't really hold them at a specific load on the dyno for too long because there's just so much going on with transmission load and everything else where the Cyvex has a definite advantage is because you can log so much at such a high frequency over a dyno run or a pool you can get a very accurate picture of what's going on and then make changes uh, re rechuck the file into the car and run again. So rather than utilise the real time side of it, we tend to focus more on, on getting a lot of wide variety of high speed data logging going and, and work from there. Sure, that, yeah, that's, that's interesting, it makes a lot of sense. Um, certainly the full power stuff, even with a, a standalone system, yeah, you're, you're not going to be holding a car at a thousand wheel horsepower for, for 10 seconds while you're making some changes, so yeah, I, I get that. So, some of the um, transient stuff and light load mapping of the car, obviously we'll do that on the dyno live with the Cybex, but if my driver, Kia, comes back to me and says, look, it's got a lit, you know, feeding it on at 25% throttle and five pounds of boost, it's kind of feels a bit leaner, it's not that smooth. I'll simply open the door and kick him out of the car and say, learn how to drive it properly. But that hasn't had to happen yet, so. But yeah, look, there are some advantages there, but the closed loop correction in it's so good, the knock control in it's so good, that you'd have to be pretty daft not to get it right straight off the bat. They're, they're pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a fairly advanced system. Okay, so you've had the car on the dyno, you've tuned it using the Cybex. Can we ask you um, how much power it's making? Yeah. Well, it, it depends on the boost level. At the moment, we've pretty much got the wastegates jammed shut. Um, it makes about 26, 27 pounds of boost on a mainline dyno with uh, those tyres on it, which are an ET Street radio. It makes about 1,006 to 1,009 horsepower at the wheels. It probably would make more power with more boost, 30 plus pounds. Uh, a, we don't have the wastegate to be into that at the moment, and B, you know, we're going to run some standing kilometre events uh, for the rest of the year in this thing, and I simply don't, I'm not that interested in pulling engines in and out of it or even watching my guys do it. So I think a thousand's enough. It's just, it's just a nice kind of little package and um, nicely streetable and, and the girls at McDonald's drive through they don't get too frightened by it. Uh, and you know, it gets, still gets let 12 litres per hundred on cruise. So yeah, it, it's all pretty good there. Uh, yeah, it does run E85 ethanol, yes. It wasn't too long ago that a thousand wheel horsepower and anything you could drive on the street was just completely unheard of. So yeah, I think that's a reasonable place to be. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing how you guys go. You're here running in the um, the, the 500 metre uh, top speed sprint. You're not actually doing the, the super lap event. What sort, of top, what sort of top speed did you pull yesterday? Well, they're taking the speed from about halfway up the track. So who knows? I mean, the data logger says about 270 k's an hour. But you see the flying 500, actually turned out to be about a flying 420, but depending on when you, where you feel like starting, for some people it's like a flying 550, so um, there's no point taking a knife to a gunfight I suppose, so we're going to make it the flying off the tyres as fast as it will go today, so that we're all on the same uh, playing field and it's level and it, we'll see how we do, but if we could, look we're the only car in the top handful that's not running a big spray of nitrous, so you know if, if we could do it normally aspirated and get up in the top two or three, which I think is on the cards, we'll be quite happy with that for the time being. 
Hey, look, that's uh, that's fair enough. You're probably also uh, undoubtedly one of the heaviest cars competing in the Flying 500, so that's got to be a disadvantage. Obviously, with your thousand wheel horsepower, that's going to even the playing field a little bit. Look, uh, Martin, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat to us here today. It's an amazing, amazingly presented car. Uh, we watched it yesterday and we were impressed with how well it went. Look forward to seeing it run today and maybe uh, upping that top speed. Good luck with everything and uh, thanks for coming along. Thank you. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.